Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm out on a night walk at the moment. <clears throat> and, um, Well, I'm not entirely sure what to speak of yet. Though I had some very urgent uh, concerns and ideas earlier in the day, um, perhaps they will reemerge in my awareness as I'm walking. It's the full moon, and of course, um, every culture deals differently with this in our modern Western cultures. This is either uh, something that's completely overlooked, largely, or completely. Um, I think farmers and people who are involved in agriculture are aware of it. In many indigenous cultures, the, the moon is at the actual timekeeper, primarily. Or the moon encompassed by the sun. Right? So there are, there are sun ceremonies, um, most often only twice a year. And then the moon is pretty much the timekeeper. And in our Western modern lives, um, we th tend to think of things with very fine cuts. This is one second, this is one minute, this is one hour, this is one day. Uh, but yet in the natural world and in living time, which is a completely different thing, <clears throat> that partakes nearly not at all of all of these cuts. Um, things flow together, and one day is different from the next, and one hour, you know, or some span of time is a different thing from another span of time because uh, the concern is not on the metric, it's on the content, right? And I was speaking with my friend today, Megan, about how confused our ideas about time are in that fundamentally time is relation and relationships cause time to blossom into myriad forms of time and context and feeling and uh, these can be profoundly complex even in a few moments right the, of course, the easiest example of this is an unexpected catastrophe, um, such as a car accident or something like this, right? Uh, but there are other, there's another kind of sudden efflorescence that happens when, when, for example, we meet a stranger with whom we have an immediate enthusiastic affinity. And now time blossoms into beautiful sharing and mutuality and the dissolving of my separate self into the relationship with another and the transformations and potentials and opportunities and possibilities that therefrom arise. You know, we are um, trained by our culture and language, particularly in English, to think of ourselves as separate individuals and that I am me and I am the same me in all times and circumstances. Um, <laughs> well, firstly, this is not even possible. It's not only implausible, it's formally not possible. Um, that thing we think of as ourselves is like an animal thinking of itself when it's in a cage separated from all other things. Right, from the weather, from the sunlight, from the moonlight, from the stars, from the plants and animals, from the humans, from everything. Yeah? And really, you can't get that kind of separation except in language. Language can imply this degree of distinction. I am myself alone, right now, always, I am myself. It's just not plausible because most of what we are, in fact, all of what we are, including the self that we're, that we're thinking about in this way, is a, a function of memory, right? So it's, a, it's, it's an illusion, yeah? 
It's an illusion of a separate self. And when we are alone, this illusion seems pervasive and maybe even real. But we are never alone because the mind with which we are alone is the progeny of myriad moments of deep and superficial, pragmatic and creative relation with other beings. In fact, our capacity to have memory is something we are trained, largely trained to <clears throat> um, in our childhood by the processes of in languaging and enculturation. So there is no self that is alone. Uh, There is no stable abiding self like the one that we, tr that we think of when we think of myself, me. Um, there is, I think what we do in our thinking and in our language, both, and both of these things are very strange things, right? Nothing is as strange as language. Language is one of the weirdest things on earth. It's far weirder than all of the things we think of as weird. Um, it's a very peculiar anomaly that, th that one of the animals here became a formal representational cognitive and then began to suffer catastrophic epochs of devolution into representation and machines. Not that representation is only bad, but our people are very vulnerable. By our people, I mean all humans. We're very vulnerable not just to the peculiar idiosyncrasies of representational thought. We're vulnerable to a vast encyclopedia of pathologies that involve language and modeling and representational thought. And this is one of the most compelling areas of concern and fascination and study for me. Um, perhaps I am optimistic in the sense that I feel that it's possible. No, I don't just feel it's possible. I know that it's achievable that we could effectively immunize humans in general, but particularly small cohorts of humans, from the problems in language with education, um, about these problems, and about how to negotiate with them. But one of the most trenchant problems we would face in such a circumstance is to get people to think differently about what it means to be a self in the world. It's true for many of us that our daily lives are spent either in working, in which case we're having mostly, probably, though not in all cases, superficial transactions with many strangers and institutions and businesses and so on. And then we're having some special time with people or animals and places that we love and care about. And we should notice that we are not the same person in those two things. We are different people. Um, we change dramatically under the influence merely of observation by another human. Um, we, our, our, our species as animals, we are evolved. I don't like the, the trope, we are wired. I don't like this trope at all. Um, doesn't mean I'll never use it, but I'm very unfond of it. We, we have evolved to be animals who are deeply concerned about observation. And in case this isn't clear, just look at the uh, superficial aspects of clothing and fashion, commodities, which brands of things we use, which shows we watch, um, our homes, our possessions, our bookshelves, all of these things are aspects of our modern behavior that get folded into display behavior, right? Where we're making displays. 
And we make displays because we are sensitive to being observed and observation changes us. If I am totally unobserved by anyone, then I will do different things than I will do if I think I might be being observed or if I think I am being observed. Now, of course, in our time, we have the really bizarre complication of having this feature of our humanity captured by the internet and social media and so on. And most of these things I think of as terrifying, really they are like demons um, or hor horrible diseases. So somebody figured out, oh, humans want to be observed. Therefore, a context was created where we could observe, you know, we could participate to some degree in observing trivi mostly trivial things about each other from day to day, moment to moment, on Facebook, Instagram, and so on. And then you got behaviors like people taking photographs of their meals. Uh, in case you think people don't want to be observed, <laughs> just watch them take photographs of food that they, you know, have, are eating or have prepared or have bought at a restaurant. And then publishing those not merely for their friends, but as an advertisement of, you know, what kind of a self is Darren? <clears throat> And of course, even these videos that I make and the recordings that I make, they are also partly a display behavior. Right? There's an idea that if we make the right kind of display, we will get new relationships and opportunities that are very valuable. Um, and this sometimes happens. Uh, but other weird things happen, like the phenomenon that we currently call influencers, which is a truly strange and frightening outgrowth of social media in the modern age. So, you know, a gentleman has just walked out of his house, across the street, he's on the phone, I'm on the phone. We're both aware of each other. Um, that changes me, and it changes him. Right? We both know, oh, there's another human nearby watching. Yeah. And we might think of, we could think of many um, ways to divide this. But if I'm thinking very simply, I'll think of three ways. Um, judgment or evaluation. Positive observation where someone is seeing me and I have reason to believe they are positively impressed with what I am doing or not doing, who I am being or not being. Um, we have voyeurism, right, which is just the, the curiosity about, well, what are other people doing? What do they do? And there are, there are a number of other features like fascination or attraction or um, threats, right? Does this person present a threat or not? All of these things. Does that person think I present a threat is another complexity that many people of color struggle with. And in, in our time um, now, uh, not people, you know, non-people of color, I guess that includes me, uh, are now finally feeling the sting of some of that themselves. Um, and of course, everything's contextual and depends on where you are, who you're with, what the context is, what's going on, what people are paying attention to. But you can see by this discussion that selves are always transforming. And when we're not in relation with actual human beings, that we have meaningful context and history or potential for deep relation with, when we are not there, then we are prone to anxiety. Because we can't tell if we have friends, if we will be helped in a crisis, if we are valued, if we are loved, if our life is meaningful, 
to whom is it meaningful if there are no others? And many people who are isolated or sick or injured or struggling to heal or to die or are struggling with terrible problems and have no real way to form new social relationships, these anxieties become extremely profound and trenchant. And they can become so profound that they take over the mind entirely. And now the self of the person is lost in a storm of confusion, resentment, anxiety, despair, um, loss of self-esteem and social face, which are, you know, so, this thing we re- that I refer to as social face is incredibly important to human beings. What, what does the every person see when they see me? What does the every person think when they, when they see me? And so we can actually be, find ourselves in situations where it's impossible to have a self at all. What we have instead are anxieties, thoughts, concerns, remembered pain or slights or histories, um, expected punishments or uh, deprivations, Um, the desire for justice, uh, for, for, for wrongs we previously suffered or traumas we've suffered, for rebalancing, for, um, for reparations, and so on. Yeah. You know... One of the things that had occurred to me to speak about was I was speaking with a friend of mine, William, the other night, and William, like all of us, has a very peculiar and and personal array of life situations. But many of these concerns that I've mentioned are important to him. And we were talking about the everyman. What does society treat me as? What does society see me as? And it occurred to me as we were speaking that the things we think of as our governments or our societies, our collectives, these are primarily bad things. Um, And some would argue, no, these are great things. Uh, They've saved us from constant war and poverty and so on. Eh. You know, there's a, uh, there's a guy who wrote a book with a bunch of statistics in it about how much better our lives are today than they ever were in the past. Well, and I read this book. And it's sort of a book about what's right in the world. I can't recall the title at the moment. And frankly, it's not even worth recalling. Although he's not entirely incorrect... Right? His statistics are not irreal. They, neither are they um, complete. Yeah. So he becomes entirely wrong if we destroy the oceans or if the atmosphere is permanently wrecked or if our bodies and environments become so poisoned that we can no longer continue to live or you know, if there's a pandemic that kills off, say... You know, two-thirds or more of the human population. Um, he's kind of got it wrong in the sense of, yeah, for the moment, the specific things he's chosen to highlight appear to have improved over, say, the past 100 or 500 years. It's true. Um, but so many other things have declined, and none of these are being accounted for in this argument. My point, however, or rather the direction I wanted to travel in, was that relating with society is really like relating with a seething, tangled mess of demons that are all vying to capture and control our attention, our awareness, our thinking, our political and relational affiliations, where we spend money, 
what we think of as valuable or what we value, what we purchase, what we don't purchase, and all of these things. And it's like living in a world where there is an array, a big collection of strange gods. And these gods are not benevolent. None of them are benevolent. Um, Our species has failed nearly entirely to establish anything resembling a benevolent society. And so we are in the grip. It's funny when people say they don't believe in God because I'd be like, you don't believe in the United States? (laughs) You don't believe in California? Uh, You don't believe in the police? You don't believe in the fire department. You don't believe in the IRS. You don't believe in Facebook, Google, Twitter, Instagram. I think they may think, no, I mean a metaphysical God. Okay, great. You don't believe in a metaphysical God. Well, it's not a requirement that you believe or don't believe in a metaphysical God. But you should recognize that in our daily lives, there are gods everywhere. They interrupt our television shows every five to eight minutes to impose their attempt at hypnotizing us on us. And then we have the actual religions as well, whether or not those have anything to do with actual gods. So it's a complex mess, but the thing that I wanted to say is simply this. Our relationships with society and and our nations and, and our nation's relationships with each other These are like bad gods, and they are very domineering, and they are unstoppably momentous. This momentum has been being built and fed and goes on and on and on, and it's part of what's killing people with COVID because apparently many people think we should continue with society the way it was before the pandemic. Well, that's an insane idea. It's not an unreasonable idea, in terms of expectations, um, but it's an unsurvivable idea in terms of pragmatic reality of life on Earth circa 2022. Hmm. And many people find themselves, this word that we use is not a very good one, But in fact, nearly everyone who isn't quite wealthy in their local context is being eviscerated in terms of the privileges and opportunities that descend to them from the hands of these strange gods that no one is in control of and that are deeply influencing and controlling our species and have effectively kidnapped us. So that's a very weird situation. Now, I've remarked in recent videos that I think it's only very recently that humans have been capable of thinking about anything like the world or even really much like their nation the United States, is a pretty new thing. Other nations are older, and that is meaningful, um, that they are older because they have richer culture and traditions, and they've preserved much older culture and traditions, even in modernity, that are important, that give um, spaciousness and dimensionality to human experience and existence and expectation, evaluation, and so on. But I think we've only been capable of thinking about the world for a very short period of time. And it's not clear to me at all that humans are endowed with the faculties that would allow us to think meaningfully about something as complex as the world. Um, What will happen instead is we will begin thinking with a peculiar set of purposes or concerns that will constrict our view. And we will begin cutting up the pie into very narrow views about some specific thing like 
the environment or identity politics. <clears throat> so I don't think we're very good, and nor do I think we are meant for thinking about the world. And this brings me to my next um, direction. It's funny, I'm looking right now at a house, and this is not the direction I was intending, that appeared recently in a very profound dreaming experience that I had. I used to know someone who lived in this home, a young African-American man who I loved very much and who was a brilliant prodigy. His name was Aaron Thompson. I don't know if he's still around. He and his mom lived in this house. And it's interesting to see the place that I saw in a dream. Now, I don't think we can fix the world. I think what we can do, and what we should perhaps do, if that's a reasonable idea at all, the shouldness idea, is we can improve the local situation. Right? We can deepen our relationships and form really rich and meaningful relationships with nature and each other and the land. And this transforms the nature of isolation, the nature of ourselves, what it means to be a self, um, dramatically, right? So the scope that we have really effective influence in is the interpersonal and perhaps the local communal scope. Um, with the onset of the internet, this has changed somewhat. We have people now who have very broad reach and very few of those seem to take that responsibility to heart. They often, or maybe just those ones I'm concerned about, see my concerns also delineate the scope of what I will look at or look for or select. Um, this is called excerption, by the way. And human representational co consciousness is highly excerptive. We make excerptions. We, we take an excerpt based on our purposes, inclinations, and sequencing what we've previously recently been exposed to and are thus, you know, sort of triggered by in our consciousness. Uh, many of these people do not seem to take their responsibilities very seriously people who've acquired enormous audiences. They seem to go about it, some of them, the ones I'm concerned with particularly, somewhat recklessly and often extremely recklessly. There are exceptions to that where people take their audiences and the scope very seriously. Um, someone who comes to mind there, I won't, neg <laughs> I won't mention the negative concerns I had, but. Daniel Schmachtenberger is someone who takes these concerns deeply to heart. And there are many other people like him, Peter Thiel, um, Eric Weinstein. Uh, and each of these are very unique and powerful minds, each of these people, these positive ones I mentioned. And so it is possible to affect broad change, but for most of us, uh, the scope is narrow. You know, I was talking with another friend of mine the other day, and he was saying, there's all these concerns and politics and news and all of this junk, and this is constantly going on, and everybody's blathering on and on about it as if it were important. But the most important thing to me is in the morning when my wife texts me that she's awake. And that's really interesting, that by itself. Right? He discovers that his wife has awoken by receiving a text on his smartphone. <laughs> this, is, this is life circa 2022. When, when I realize my, my wife is awake, then I go to the kitchen and I make us some tea. And we go out in the backyard with our animals. And we sit and have tea and the peacefulness and beauty of that moment is so profound. And this, I think, is meaningful. And he said, you know, how can this affect the world? 
And I said, well, maybe we're all connected. And I don't think it's actually a maybe. I think it's a certainty. The human cognition is a real thing. We are all um, deeply connected in hundreds of ways we have no language or ideas about. We influence each other's minds without obvious mechanism, superficial mechanism. Our bodies and minds are influenced by each other and the world situation constantly. The world is our body, and our body is a sub-body of the world, and all of these things seem very clear to me, though I'm not trying to convince anyone of them particularly. But the analogy I gave to him was, you know, when the kidney is in good health, it cleans the blood very, very effectively. And this relieves tension on the whole body. Yeah? And so maybe the peacefulness and the joy that you experience there, maybe they are cleansing the world. Something like this. And once again, we see here a completely different idea of the meaningfulness of what it means to be a person or, or a self. Yeah? That we have the capacity by living meaningfully and by engaging each other with grace and respect and reverence and awareness to transform the invisible aspects underneath all the superficial noise that turn out to be truly important in life. And so I'd like to highlight the perspective that we can't take care of the world. The problems of the world are enormous and profoundly complex. But what we might be able to do together, even in very small groups, even in a group of two people, a man and his wife in the backyard with their animals. Of course, that's the people plus the animals, plus the place, plus the sky, plus, yeah, right. What we might be able to do is become a place, a living place of deep, reverence and love and awareness and softness and kindness and generosity and virtue. And this is profoundly meaningful. And as times become more dark and confusing, it simply becomes more meaningful. In a time of great crisis, small acts of beauty are profoundly transformative and informative. And so even in small groups, perhaps especially in small groups, we might be able to forge a new ways of being, new ways of being human together that turn out to become contagious. We can form the opposite of a pathogen. Right? We can form something that spreads and transforms the world together a little bit at a time, one seed here, one seed there. But this, it seems to me, is one of the best hopes we have for creating opportunities for the future of life on Earth, for humanity, and particularly for each other in our day-to-day -day lives. Thank you for joining me. I deeply appreciate the time that you spend in attending my walkabouts. And I deeply value your questions, thoughts, concerns. Please feel free to add them in the comments. And I also deeply value anyone who would like to share um, or, uh, <laughs> you know, advertise my work <laughs> so that I might, might reach, so that my display behavior could succeed a bit more effectively. <laughs> All blessings to you. May you and those you love be safe and happy and joyful and have beauty in your lives. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>